So in the last lecture, we talked about excitons, and actually, the, no, and we, and we also talked about indirect absorption. So the last three lectures were really about absorption. So the opposite process of absorption is emission, and therefore, uh, in this lecture, I have uh, two topics. Uh, the first one is uh, the emission of photons, the inverse process to absorption, and um, photoluminescence and other luminescence uh, experimental techniques. And then in the second part of the, the lecture, I will uh, talk about uh, quantum structures, quantum wells, quantum wires, quantum dots. And um, so today's lecture covers these two uh, chapters from uh, Mark Fox's book on optical properties of solids, uh, chapters five and six. So what we discussed the last few lectures is that if we have electrons in the ground state, then we have an incoming photon, and that incoming photon takes an electron from the ground state and lifts it to the conduction band or the excited state. So that is an absorption process and it requires an incoming photon. But now let's say that we do have, an, we do have a process which directly injects electrons into the excited state. So then um, the ex the electron into the excited state will not usually be injected directly into the bottom of the conduction band, but instead it will have some higher energy. So the first thing that this injected electron has to do is it needs to relax, lose some of its energy, and come to the bottom of this conduction band. We're also assuming that we can inject holes through a similar process and then the hole will also relax to the top of the valence band and then we will have um, holes sitting at the valence band maximum. So we have electrons and we have holes and what will happen is that the electrons recombine with the holes and this can go in with two different types of mechanisms. The first mechanism is a non-radiative uh, recombination that the energy of this electron hole pair is simply released to the crystal uh, as some form of heat. Uh, there can be a defect uh, a recombination, there can be uh, threading dislocations or other types of um, recombination centers which do not lead to non-radiative recombination. Usually that process is undesirable because it takes away from the light emitting properties of this material. So the other uh, recombination process, the desirable one, is where an electron and hole recombine and emit a photon of the same energy as the band gap, the difference between the ground state and the excited state. So this process is called radiative recombination and the rate of this radiative recombination happening is described by this Einstein coefficient A for spontaneous emission and the radiative lifetime is the inverse of this Einstein coefficient. And you may remember that in one of the earlier lectures we talked about um, the Einstein coefficients. The uh, total recombination rate has two terms. There is one term which is the radiative recombination term and there's another term which describes the non-radiative recombination and both of these need to be multiplied with the number of electron hole pairs that we have. So radiative and non-radiative recombination will compete and therefore the photoluminescence or the uh, luminescent emission uh, efficiency is uh, this efficiency eta is derived from the ratio of the radiative to the non-radiative recombination rate. <coughs> 
So to have a good light emitting diode or a good semiconductor laser, we want to make the radiative uh, recombination rate as high as possible and the non-radiative rate uh, should be low so that the radiative recombination rate will dominate. So that's an overview of uh, what we can expect from light emission. So with the next few slides I will show you um, a number of experimental setups how such emission processes can be observed in the laboratory. So the first step is that we have to inject electrons and holes and one way to accomplish that is with optical excitation. So we need some sort of a light source that will create electron hole pairs and typically that is done with a laser. And um, lasers, uh, there's many forms of lasers today. We only need a few milliwatts so we have many wavelengths that we can use. Uh, there are lasers from the infrared to the visible all the way to the UV. So many different uh, types of wavelengths and the uh, wavelength of the laser is important depending on the type of process and the type of material that we want to investigate. The only uh, requirement really is that the laser photon energy must be larger than the band gap Otherwise, we cannot inject any electron hole pairs. On the other hand, if the laser energy is too large, then there may be some other processes, uh, some other complications. So usually one chooses a laser with an energy that is a little bit larger than the band gap. So then using some mirrors and lenses, the laser is focused on the sample. In order to uh, modulate this process, uh, this uh, ratio of the radiative to the non-radiative recombination rate, in order to minimize non-radiative recombination, one typically wants the sample to be at low temperatures where the non-radiative recombination rate is not as large. And therefore one puts the sample into a cryostat if we put the sample into uh, a liquid helium bath, so the sample is floating in liquid helium, and if we pump on the liquid helium to make it a superfluid, then uh, temperatures between 1 and 2 Kelvin can easily be achieved. If the sample is in vacuum and only in contact uh, with a uh, cold finger typically made of copper which holds the liquid helium, then one can achieve temperatures of maybe uh, 10 Kelvin and if we want to work with liquid nitrogen then we can go down to perhaps 80 Kelvin. So the sample is in a cryostat so that we can achieve low temperatures. So the laser ex uh, excites the sample and then we want to collect the um, emitted photons and unlike in a reflection experiment where the uh, reflected beam is specularly reflected, in this case the light is emitted in all directions and therefore we need collection lenses to focus the laser spot onto the entrance slit of a spectrometer. And then uh, here we have a spectrometer which um, separates the various wavelengths of emitted light. And then we have a detector and a, a computer which uh, registers the data. Um, in the early days, uh, we had uh, single channel detectors like a silicon diode with a single pixel or a photomultiplier. Uh, therefore, such photoluminescence experiments would take a very long time and the efficiency was not that great. Uh, nowadays, the detector is typically a CCD or some other form of camera which can detect 512 or even more wavelengths at the same time. And therefore, the uh, data acquisition is, a is maybe 500 or 1,000 times faster than it used to be.
Um, we can use filters somewhere here in the beam path uh, to reject unwanted light. Uh, we can use uh, polar polarizers in the incident beam path and in the reflected uh, and in the scattered beam path uh, in order to look at um, the angular momentum of the electron hole pairs that uh, we are exciting. And um, the photoluminescence is uh, typically very weak and um, maybe something like one photon every second. So if you have only one count every second, then every green or red LED from the computer will show up in your signal. So you have to walk around the lab and really put black tape over everything that uh, generates a little bit of light. So uh, absolute darkness is usually very important in order to uh, get uh, low, get signals with very low dark counts. Um, there are several different types of uh, photoluminescence and the type that I will talk about today is interband photoluminescence. Uh, there are other types of photoluminescence that have to do with defects in the crystal and those I will not talk about today. That's not my specialty. Maybe I will say a little bit about it uh, at the next lecture in two weeks. Uh, but uh, in interband luminescence, what happens is that uh, we inject electrons in holes. So here is our sea of electrons and here is our sea of holes. And we have to remember that both electrons and holes are fermions so not all electrons can sit here at the bottom of the conduction band, but we really have this uh, electron gas or electron liquid in the conduction band and similarly for the holes. And uh, in a direct, so that we're assuming here that this is a direct semiconductor and then the electrons will recombine with the holes and will emit a photon and a photoluminescence spectrum is shown here for gallium nitride and for at 4 Kelvin and the uh, by the solid line so the solid line shows the, the emission spectrum the photoluminescence spectrum the dotted line shows the absorption spectrum and what you see is that the photoluminescence peak and the absorption peak are you know roughly at about the same uh, photon energy, but not quite. Uh, usually there is a redshift of the photoluminescence relative to the uh, absorption threshold or the absorption maximum and that has a variety of reasons and uh, perhaps most importantly if the material that we study is inhomogeneous then an absorption spectrum will measure something like an average crystal. But if the crystal is inhomogeneous, then the photoluminescence will come from the part of the crystal which has the smallest band gap. So that is the reason why we usually see some sort of a redshift in the photoluminescence. And this is something that we can talk more about when we talk about defects. Uh, also in semiconductor alloys, you can have statistical fluctuations of the alloy composition and then an absorption experiment measures the average composition but the photoluminescence comes from parts of the crystal where the energy is the lowest depending on composition. Um, the, so this is uh, photoluminescence from a direct crystal where the photoluminescence peak directly gives us the band gap, the separation between the electrons and the holes. The situation is different if we have an indirect semiconductor. Remember that for an absorption process in an indirect semiconductor, this is a two-step process. We need a photon, but we also need a phonon which uh, satisfies the uh, conservation of crystal momentum. So this is a, a silicon germanium alloy uh, 
where the uh, electrons uh, have a, uh, are in a conduction band minimum, which is away from the zone center. And the holes are here at the zone center at the valence band maximum. This electron cannot directly recombine with this hole because the momentum is different. So the electron first has to be scattered by a phonon and then it can recombine. And uh, or if the, so that would, uh, instead of uh, having a phonon satisfy the conservation of crystal momentum, uh, we can also have an alloy or a defect. And in such cases, the defects in the crystal can satisfy momentum conservation. So if we look at uh, photoluminescent spectra, of silicon germanium alloys at different temperatures. Let's just look at the uh, four Kelvin line, uh, the four Kelvin spectrum. Then you see that there are two peaks. There's one peak here and another peak here. And then there's a little bit of a shoulder here. So in, for this peak, which is called the TO peak, the transverse optical peak, uh, this in this case, the, uh, remember this is uh, wavelength, not energy. So the energy of the TO peak is lower than the energy of this peak. So the energy of the emitted photon is equal to the band gap minus the energy of that phonon. So this is the TO peak where a TO phonon is responsible for the momentum conservation. This little hump here is the TA process, which is much weaker. So here a transverse acoustic phonon is responsible for the uh, momentum conservation. But in addition to these phonon replicas, we also have no phonon peaks. And how can that be? Well, like I said earlier, this is an alloy, it's not a perfect crystal. In a perfect crystal, there would be no, no phonon line. But in a semiconductor alloy, the translational symmetry is broken. And therefore, we also see a no phonon peak. Uh, when you look at the temperature dependence, you'll see that the um, energy changes. And at this energy, at 9 Kelvin, we actually have two peaks because this peak here, the peak labeled X, that peak is a defect peak. And the peak Fe, that is really the free exciton uh, that we're interested in for today's lecture. So there's a defect peak X and a free electron peak. So um, this is a paper from uh, Isabella Alonso. Uh, she grew the crystals for this study. And actually, uh, most of the crystals in this paper were provided by Josef Humlicek. Uh, they were part of the Soviet uh, space program. Uh, they were grown in uh, Tbilisi in the uh, Soviet, uh, in the Georgian Soviet Republic, so that was a long time ago. See the date, 1989. Uh, but it was very helpful to have access to these crystals. Um, plotted here is the photoluminescence energy as a function of composition. There's two different data sets from two different papers, so don't worry about that. So you see uh, silicon, where the germanium content is zero. Silicon has a band gap of around 1.15 electron volts. And in germanium, in pure germanium, the um, band gap is around 0 0.7 electron volts. So one might expect that for an alloy, there should be a linear uh, relationship between the photon energy and the composition. Well, obviously, this is not the case at all. So the curve sort of goes like this. You know, sometimes there's a little bit of a bowing. So some quadratic deviation from linear behavior, that can be explained with a quadratic bowing parameter. But so it's, it starts going this way, but then there's an abrupt change in the slope. And all of a sudden, the um, behavior looks very different. So why is that? Well, in silicon, the conduction band minimum 
is at the delta, is along delta, but in germanium the conduction band minimum is at the L point. So these crystals for, um, for a germanium content less than 85%, the silicon germanium alloys are silicon-like, where the conduction band minimum is along 100, and these crystals for a germanium content greater than 85%, are germanium-like, so we see this change from the silicon-like to the germanium-like band structure, and that is responsible for the kink in these photoluminescence data. So, electrons are fermions, and holes are fermions, and therefore, uh, we observe not only the recombination right here at the zone center, but we also see recombinations for K non equal to zero because due to the Pauli exclusion principle, the electrons uh, have a, a distribution. So let's look at that in more detail. This again is the band structure of let's say gallium arsenide and the laser photon comes in and creates an electron hole pair uh, somewhere high in the band because the laser energy is somewhat larger than the band gap. So the photo excited electron and hole are inside that red circle. So first what will happen is that these electrons and holes need to relax down to the bottom of the conduction band. And uh, each emission, uh, so each, st so the, the, the electrons relax by emission of longitudinal optical phonons, at least that's true for gallium arsenide or other polar materials. Um, this is called the Frölich interaction, so therefore the electrons emit energy in discrete packets equal to a phonon energy, and each of these emission processes uh, takes approximately 140 femtoseconds, something like that. The time for recombination is on the order of nanoseconds in a good semiconductor crystal, and therefore the relaxation process, the emission of phonons, is much faster than the recombination process, which is rather slow. So at first, the electrons will emit phonons and reduce their energy, that is called uh, cooling. And there's another process which is very fast. So you see, in the beginning, all electrons and holes have rather high energies. So if we plot the distribution of the electrons and holes, then all the electrons will be up here, all the holes will be down here. So this is an extreme non-equilibrium uh, carrier distribution and by scattering between electrons and holes and by um, uh, emission of phonons, uh, a thermal distribution of electrons and holes uh, will become established. So the the thermal equilibrium, so this, this uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution is established on a time scale which is probably even shorter than the relaxation of the carriers down to the um, conduction band minimum. And we have, so we have these distributions of electrons and holes in the, valen in the conduction band in the valence band. We call this a quasi-thermal distribution because the temperature of the electrons and the holes will be much larger than the uh, temperature of the crystal. Let's say we do this experiment at 4 Kelvin or we do this experiment at room temperature. We can calculate the initial electron hole temperature from the excess energy provided by the laser. So we, we take the photon energy of the laser and we subtract the band gap 
and that gives us some delta E and we divide by KT and that we divide by the Boltzmann constant and that gives us a temperature of the carriers. So the temperature of these carriers can be 1,000 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin, depending on uh, how much uh, energy we put in uh, from the laser. And uh, so this, and this distribution here might relate to uh, a, a very high temperature much larger than the lattice temperature. The electrons and the holes may or may not be in thermal equilibrium. Sometimes the electrons are a bit hotter than the holes, but both are definitely much larger than the lattice. So if we are dealing with uh, low carrier densities and high carrier temperatures, this temperature here is not the temperature of the crystal, it's not the temperature of the bath, it's the temperature of the electrons in holes. So in this low carrier density, high temperature regime, we can approximate these uh, distributions with a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the total number of photo-excited electrons uh, is, is some integral over the uh, density of states and the density of states goes like the square root of the energy minus the gap times this prefactor which mostly has the electron mass to the power of three halves. So that's the um, density of states and in this integral the density of states is multiplied with the distribution function for the carriers. So the total number of electrons is given by this integral and we have a similar expression for the holes. So when we look at a um, photoluminescence spectrum of gallium arsenide, then we see that this is not a sharp peak, but the peak is very asymmetric. We have a relatively sharp rise right at the um, band gap but then the drop towards higher energies is much slower than the rise. So that's a typical uh, photoluminescence spectrum. And why is that? Well, what we are probing, what we are probing is not electrons and holes that are all here at the um, conduction band minimum, at the band extrema, but instead we're probing luminescence from this thermal distribution of electrons in holes and that's why we have to consider not only where most of the electrons are sitting which is at the band edge but we also have to consider the tails in this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and therefore we will get this contribution to, to the luminescence from the electron hole pairs that are in the uh, that are in the tails of the distribution. It is even better to plot the photoluminescence spectrum not on the linear scale but on a logarithmic scale and then we typically get this uh, exponential type uh, slope towards higher energies and the slope that we have here is the uh, temperature of the electron hole pairs. So spectra will look very different depending on the temperature that we use and um, because we can see the carrier temperature in the high energy tail of the um, photoluminescence. So now let's go to uh, the opposite um, case where the carrier density is high and the uh, temperature is low. In this case we can no longer approximate the distribution function with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Instead, we have to use a Fermi-Dirac distribution. And now this picture is more adequate that we really have this and at, at very low temperatures, this is really a sea of electrons and a sea of holes where we have established quasi-Fermi energy. So this is the Fermi energy or the quasi-Fermi energy this is the quasi-Fermi energy for the electrons and this is the quasi-Fermi energy for the holes. And in this case, what we see is we see a fast rise of the photoluminescence and then we see a plateau. 
and f the, that plateau is the sum of the quasi-Fermi energies of the electrons and the holes, and then we see an exponential decay which is related to the carrier temperature. In order to achieve such high carrier densities, we cannot simply increase the intensity of the laser because the crystal would melt. So what we have to do is we have to hit this um, semiconductor with a ultra short pulse, maybe one picosecond or a few picoseconds, maybe a hundred femtoseconds. And uh, therefore we do this as a time dependent experiment and after 24 picoseconds, we see that the uh, spectrum is broad because the quasi-Fermi energies are high, but if we wait from 24 picoseconds to 250 picoseconds, then the carrier, and then the, uh, carrier density has decreased significantly, and therefore, after a long time, the... Um, peak has become much uh, narrower. Um, this time scale, 250 picoseconds, is usually much too slow for radiative recombination, so probably what reduces the carrier density here is uh, Auger recombination, uh, which is a highly nonlinear process, but one that I won't talk about here. Um, the quasi-Fermi uh, energy uh, can be uh, approximated with uh, this uh, equation here. So the quasi-Fermi energy is uh, proportional to the carrier density uh, multiplied by the uh, power of two-thirds. And uh, I should say in the 1980s, when, uh, first, when ultrafast lasers first became popular, there were a lot of experiments around the world where uh, people looked at semiconductors, highly excited semiconductors, and performed um, uh, time-resolved photoluminescence experiments. And um, I did a diploma thesis in Stuttgart where I looked at uh, such carrier cooling uh, processes, for example. Uh, one of the, uh, there were three groups really that did this uh, ultrafast spectroscopy. Uh, there was a group at Bell Labs uh, led by Jack Shaw. Uh, there was a, a group at IBM uh, led by uh, Jeff Cash and Jim Tsang. That's not this, uh, this is Kathy Cash, that's a different person. And uh, also there was a very good group uh, at the Joffe Institute in uh, Leningrad. Um, so what we're looking at in this picture is uh, these are gallium arsenide quantum wells. So very thin layers of gallium arsenide at 10 Kelvin. And uh, we're plotting here the photoluminescence, the photoluminescence intensity as a function of photon energy. And uh, at after nine picoseconds, so right after the excitation with the laser, um, the slope is very shallow and therefore we have a very high car uh, carrier temperature so after nine picoseconds, we have, a temp we have a temperature of 110 Kelvin. And then after 50 picoseconds, the slope has become steeper. And after 200 picoseconds, it is uh, really steep. And from the slope of this curve on a logarithmic scale, we can determine the carrier temperature. So what we do in this graph is that now we plot the carrier temperature as a function of time delay for different uh, excitation densities. This is the calculation. This is what the carrier temperature should look like as a function of delay time using this 140 femtosecond emission time that I told you about earlier. So it takes 140 femtoseconds to emit an LO phonon, uh, 
And if that's the case, then all the cooling should happen very, very rapidly. That's what the calculation indicates. But as you see, the, um, the cooling is really much slower. Why is that? The excited electrons need to emit uh, LO phonons with a uh, very small wave vector, but there's only a limited phase space available for these LO phonons, and therefore we are creating so many of these LO phonons that the emission and the reabsorption of such a phonon are equally possible. So we're creating a huge non-equilibrium uh, distribution of phonons, and therefore the, um, cool, the carrier cooling is not determined by the electron phonon emission time of 140 femtoseconds. What really governs this cooling is the decay time of the uh, LO phonons into acoustic phonons, and that typically takes somewhere between 7 and 10 or 15 picoseconds. So it's, it's 100 times slower. So it's the lifetime of these LO phonons which determines the carrier cooling. So these experiments were done at uh, relatively low temperatures, uh, one can also do these experiments at uh, height. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this was done at low carrier densities. One can also do this at high carrier density. And that's why we're getting this very broad profile, which comes from the Fermi Dirac distribution. But even at such uh, high uh, carrier densities, we can still get a phonon temperature from a fit to this luminescence curve. Uh, to this type of an equation. Um, there are other things that can happen under high laser excitation with high carrier density. So if the carrier density is low, then we have a valence band and we have a conduction band. Carrier density is zero. In the uh, absence of carriers, the Fermi energy is roughly halfway between the valence band and the conduction band. That is not exactly true because it also depends on the uh, masses of the valence band and the conduction band, but very roughly the Fermi edge is somewhere uh, in the middle of the gap. And then we can have absorption of light to create electron hole pairs, and we can have emission of light by the recombination of electron hole pairs. So that's all that happens um, at zero carrier density. Now let's say that we have a high density of electron hole pairs uh, after intense laser excitation, or another way to create a high density of electrons is with a high doping density. So because we have this uh, high carrier density, instead of the conduction band being empty, at least at very low temperatures at absolute zero, all these states in the conduction band would be filled and the rest would be empty. At this high carrier density, what will happen is that due to many body effects, the uh, electric fields in the crystal, which are responsible for the creation of the band gap, uh, these electric fields are screened and therefore the uh, band gap shrinks. And that is known as band gap renormalization. So if we do photoluminescence in such a highly excited crystal with many, many electrons, then we will see a photoluminescence energy which is redshifted. We see a photoluminescence energy which is lower in a highly doped crystal or highly excited crystal compared to a uh, crystal where the uh, carrier density is zero. So high carrier densities are responsible for what is called band gap renormalization, that the band gap is lowered. And we can measure that with photoluminescence. And those measurements were done uh, also in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> 
So the photoluminescence is redshifted. But what about the absorption? Well, in a, if there are no carriers, we can make an absorption process from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. But what about here? If we try to go from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band, no absorption process can happen here. Because the, these states here, they're all full. And therefore, the absorption process right at the band edge is blocked. Uh, so we call this Pauli blocking. These states are full, so we also call it band filling. And therefore, the threshold for absorption is here and higher. So we see a blue shift in the absorption process because the lower energy absorption processes are not possible. So what we see in highly excited uh, semiconductors are two things. We see a redshift of the photoluminescence together with a blue shift of the absorption. That blue shift is called the uh, Burstein mass shift. And um, there is a phase transition from this low carrier regime to this high carrier regime that is called the Mott transition. And this, uh, where this transition occurs uh, depends on the interparticle separation RS, and I will talk about that more on the next slide. Uh, so from the carrier density, if we assume that each carrier is a solid sphere, then we can calculate the uh, separation of these carriers, and that gives us this parameter RS, and it's simply uh, calculated from the, uh, from the volume of a sphere around each carrier. Um, when we deal with high density effects, all energies, temperatures, and diameters or, or distances are renormalized with the appropriate excitonic quantities. So the square root out of this, the cube root of this carrier density, that is a distance. And then we take this distance and we divide it by the excitonic radius. And then we have this dimensionless parameter RS. And we start to see high carrier effects when that RS is on the order of five. So if the distance between two electrons is on the order of five excitonic radii, then we will start seeing many body effects. Here we see um, photoluminescence spectra versus energy at 4.2 Kelvin in gallium arsenide for various different uh, excitation densities. At 10 to the 17, we have a very high energy emission and a very sharp peak. As we increase the um, excitation of the uh, density to uh, about 10 to the 20 electron hole pairs. And so as we increase the carrier density, we see this redshift, but of course we also see a broadening because of the uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. So we clearly see this redshift in highly excited gallium arsenide. Um, this can also be seen in uh, silicon and germanium. And uh, there are two uh, highly cited papers which uh, quantify this redshift. And now, calculating this redshift is very difficult because it's a many body effect. I have a question. Yes. About this mass transition. Yes. So, the, uh, so your question is about the mass transition. What I said is that if the carriers are very far apart, they don't see each other. And therefore, I can treat them as independent particles. I only need to treat them as an individual exciton. Uh, 
Now I'm increasing the density, and that means the distance between the distance between the electron hole pairs becomes smaller and smaller. And when the distance is about five times the uh, diameter of the exciton, at that point, the two excitons start seeing each other. And that is the mod transition because I no longer consider individual excitons, but I have to, I have to consider the many body effects of many uh, electron holes, uh, electrons in holes interacting with each other. Okay? So uh, there are two papers which have tried to address this um, theoretically, and I won't even attempt to explain how this calculation is done because that's very complicated. But uh, this is a calculation, Vashista and Kalia, and you see that this plots the excitonic, uh, this plots the redshift in. Rydbergs, well, the Rydberg is not 13.6 electron volts. This is the excitonic Rydberg, which depends on the material. So this is the excitonic binding energy. So this is the redshift, and this is the interparticle separation. And the um, at-large particle separations, there is no redshift. And as the particles get closer and closer to each other, the redshift becomes larger and larger, and there is an equation which has Rs and Rs squared as the parameter, so that's the interparticle separation, and then it has one, two, three, four parameters. Now, the interesting thing is that this equation is valid for any semiconductor that has been studied. The parameters A, B, C, D, they are all the same, and all that I need to do is I need to scale the energy and the distance with the excitonic radius and the excitonic binding energy. So then I get this curve here. So this calculation was done, uh, this calculation was done uh, for low temperatures. The other paper I like in this context is by uh, Zimmermann. And uh, in his case, he introduced a temperature but you see this is not a T, but it is a sort of a strange T because the temperature has also been scaled with the uh, excitonic binding energy. So KT is, is given in terms of the excitonic binding energy. And now this equation only has one, two parameters and the interparticle separation and this temperature which has been scaled according to uh, the excitonic radius. And um, so if you plot this, uh, these data are for silicon and germanium in this graph, uh, but uh, you can use this expression for many different uh, semiconductors, gallium arsenide, gallium antimonide, uh, many different systems. So that's bank gap renormalization. And the bank gap renormalization describes the redshift in the photoluminescence, but now we want to talk about the bursting mass shift which is the blue shift in the absorption coefficient. So uh, Eli Burstein was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Mass, I don't know. Uh, you find a very good description in Grundmann's book on the physics of semiconductors. So here what is plotted is the absorption threshold. So that's the energy gap which has been measured using uh, absorption spectroscopy. So this is the absorption threshold as a function of electron density. That's the initial, that's the original graph from uh, Eli Burstein's paper for indium and timonite. And at very low densities, the uh, band gap of indium and timonite is 0 0.2 electron volts. But if you use highly doped indium and timonite, then at 10 to the 19, at a, at a carrier density of 10 to the 19, the uh, band gap of indium and timonite seems to have increased to 0 0.4 electron volts. So by doping with 10 to the 19, you almost double the band gap. Well, why is that? Because these states here are filled, 
and the absorption can only occur at higher energies because Pauli blocking prevents absorption at the 0 0.2 direct band gap. So the band gap is the, the, the gap that is measured by bursting isn't really the band gap, but it is the threshold of absorption where you measure the sum of the band gap and the uh, Fermi level uh, from, the, uh, from the doping. And <clears throat> this, uh, Eli, this uh, uh, bursting mass shift, the magnitude of this bursting mass shift uh, has two contributions. There's the red shift from band gap renormalization plus the blue shift from the band filling. And uh, if one adds these two up, there's the ratio of the electron to the whole mass. But if everything gets added up, we see this factor n to the power of two-thirds, which is, again, this factor that has to do with um, the uh, high density of electron hole pairs. So here, I think there's only two data points. I I tried to read the paper, but it's, it's very old. It's, it's 65 years old, so it's very hard to read this paper. The example that I like much better uh, for the bursting mass shift comes from Fujiwara. And uh, these are ellipsometry experiments on gallium-doped zinc oxide. And using ellipsometry spectra, Fujiwara, uh, extracts the band gap of uh, doped zinc oxide. So for low doping, on the order of 3 times 10 to the 19, for low doping, he finds a much lower energy than for high doping. This is 6.5 times 10 to the 20. Uh, why are people interested in gallium doped zinc oxide? Well, zinc oxide has a band gap of uh, three, three and a half electron volts. So the band gap of zinc oxide is in the ultraviolet. So you can use zinc oxide as a transparent conductor because the absorption coefficient is zero uh, throughout the uh, visible spectral region. And then because of the doping, there will be a Drude term here in the uh, infrared and the doping makes this zinc oxide into a conductor. So you have a transparent conductor. And Fujiwara's interest here is primarily in solar cells. But of course, there are other ex uh, examples for trans where transparent conductors are needed as well. Uh, probably uh, um, displays, for example. So we see that there is a blue shift, a very nice blue shift as a function of doping, and we see very nice absorption spectra. And now what Fujiwara did was he plots the band gap energy as a function of n to the power of two-thirds, and he gets a very, very nice uh, linear relationship between the band gap and the uh, into the power of two-thirds. So this clearly is a many-body effect. And I should mention in this graph, you not only see zinc oxide doped with gallium, you also see tin doped indium oxide. So this is ITO, indium doped tin oxide, which is the more commonly used, uh, more commonly used transparent conductor. The problem is that indium is a rare element and indium is very expensive, so therefore, if, in, if ITO could be replaced with gallium doped zinc oxide, then uh, that could uh, be more sustainable and reduce cost. So, um, the last uh, 20 minutes or so, I've talked about high density effects, and I've talked about uh, photoluminescence before that. Uh, but now we want to look at uh, other material, we want to look at, at other types of emission effects. If you have a material which is a good, uh, which has good photoluminescence properties, then this is not going to be a product. You're not going to sell that. 
because nobody's going to carry around a laser in one hand to excite something and then the device in the other hand. So what you really want is you want a material where the injection, the initial injection of electron hole pairs is done electrically so that you can have a battery attached to your device which then emits the light. So now you can have a laser pointer, right? That's an elect so this is an electroluminescent device. Uh, you have a battery and you're applying a voltage. You have a PN junction. And um, at this PN junction, right at the junction, there's an intrinsic region. And here at the PN junction, you can create electron hole pairs by electrical injection. And then you get uh, your uh, photon emission. Um, I don't think I've shown this diagram here before, but you know that this, you see that this is a uh, green, uh, this is a green laser pointer, there's also red laser pointers, and if you want to make a display, then you need to cre be able to create all kinds of colors, red, green, yellow, orange, blue, whatever, you want to create all kinds of colors. So it's important that we have different types of materials where we can um, create different types of band gaps. And until the 80s or 90s, most materials that people looked at were these zinc blend type, uh, were these uh, zinc blend type 3-5 uh, compound semiconductors. Gallium arsenide, of course, is the most common one. The problem with gallium arsenide is that it is in the infrared. And if you mix aluminum and gallium arsenide, then you can create uh, aluminum gallium arsenide alloys which emit in the red. But if you want to go to higher energies, in the zinc blend 3.5 world, you have to go to gallium phosphide, aluminum phosphide, aluminum arsenide, and all of these are indirect materials. And because they are indirect, they need a phonon uh, to uh, accommodate the um, recombination. And therefore, these indirect materials are not very good light emitters. So the breakthrough came with the development of 3,5 nitride semiconductors. Indium nitride has a band gap of around one electron volts. Aluminum nitride has a band gap of six electron volts. Gallium, gallium nitride is in between. So if you look at this line here connecting gallium nitride and indium nitride, then uh, you see that the entire visible spectral range can be uh, covered with the right uh, alloy fraction of indium rel relative to gallium. So, um, Shuji Nakamura won the Nobel Prize for creating the first uh, semiconductor lasers using indium gallium nitride. And um, this really has revolutionized uh, the lighting industry, we no longer use incandescent light bulbs with a uh, tungsten filament, but instead we have uh, white LEDs, which are based on these uh, indium gallium nitride uh, devices. When you look at traffic lights, uh, there's no longer a white lamp and then a colored piece of glass in front of it, but instead of that, we just have uh, red and yellow and uh, green LEDs which are in the traffic light. Uh, these LEDs are, I would say, at least a factor of a hundred more efficient uh, than, uh, than um, incandescent uh, uh, light bulbs and therefore we can serve a lot of, uh, we can conserve a lot of energy. So that's electroluminescence, and we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that later. And the other process I wanted to talk about is cathodoluminescence, which is yet another very, very different uh, mechanism for light emission. 
So in cathodal luminescence, we start with an electron beam uh, in an electron microscope. So this is a technique where you introduce a sample into a scanning electron microscope. You have an electron beam, you're in vacuum. And then the electrons hit the sample here, and there's some backscattered electrons. But the electron beam can penetrate somewhat into the uh, material, so the penetration depth might be a hundredth of angstroms or maybe even a thousand or a little more. So we have this excited volume and then we have a monochromator and a detector somewhere off to the side and we detect the light which is emitted from the crystal here. So in this case, the electrons which come in with a very high energy, maybe two or three thousand electron volts, each electron will create uh, maybe a thousand electron hole pairs. Uh, and uh, that is how we can detect the uh, photoluminescence. But the reason we do cathodoluminescence is because the uh, because we're interested in imaging defects, so there will be a difference in the radiative and re uh, non-radiative recombination rate in the vicinity of a defect and whether this electron beam hits a good piece of the crystal or a bad piece of the crystal, that will change the uh, cathodoluminescence intensity that we detect. Um, Cathodoluminescence is especially useful to look for dislocations in wide band gap materials uh, such as gallium nitride where there are lots and lots of dislocations or um, uh, Len Brilson has used cathodoluminescence uh, for, uh, to image thronium titanate. So from electroluminescence the next step is that we want to make a semiconductor laser. So how exactly does this uh, photoluminescence process work, this electroluminescence process work? Uh, for the electroluminescence, we need a PN junction. So we need P-type and N-type regions. So in a p-type semiconductor, in an undoped semiconductor, the Fermi level is here in the middle of the gap, in an undoped semiconductor. In a p-type semiconductor, the Fermi level can be in the valence band if the doping is high enough. And then in the n-type region, the Fermi level is in the conduction band. So the Fermi level is sort of like an equilibrium energy. And if you have two different materials, for one material the Fermi level can be here, for the other material it can be here. So you bring them together and now you have a discontinuity in the Fermi level. That cannot happen. So what will happen is that the electrons where the higher Fermi level is, they will flow to the region where the Fermi level is lower because that allows the uh, electrons to reduce their energy. But as the electrons flow from the high Fermi level region to the low Fermi level region, an electric field will build up because the carriers flow from one region to the other region. So this is the situation where we have brought these two materials together Electrons flow from the n-type to the p-type region and therefore an internal electric field builds up. So this is energy versus distance. So the, the electrons will keep flowing until the Fermi levels of the holes and the Fermi levels of the electrons are at the same energy. So now we have a built-in electric field. And we also have this depleted region between the P and N type regions because the electrons have left that region in order to build up that field. So now let's apply an external electric field 
of the same magnitude as the band gap and this applied electric field will erase the built-in electric field and now we will really have this discontinuity. So in the absence of a field we cannot have a discontinuity of the Fermi level but now we apply a voltage and we drive the device into flat band conditions where the valence band is continuous and the um, conduction band is continuous and in flat band, in this flat band uh, condition there is a small overlap region similar to the depletion region that we had before and in this overlap region we have holes here and electrons here in the same spatial region. In the flat band region I cannot have electron hole recombination because the electrons are on the right and the holes are on the left, the wave functions do not overlap, I cannot have recombination. But in the flat band condition there is this overlap right at the junction where the electrons and the holes overlap and therefore I can uh, therefore they can recombine and uh, emit photons. So that is the physical mechanism for um, electroluminescence. And here is a, uh, an electroluminescence an electroluminescence spectrum versus photon energy for gallium arsenide at room temperature. I'm using a uh, current supplied to the device of one milliamp and now one could uh, calculate the total energy that is put into the crystal by this current and by the voltage and the total energy that comes out and we can use that to calculate the efficiency of this device and it is usually on the order of a few percent maybe even ten percent which is much much higher than a light bulb with tungsten. Yes, the question. You mentioned boundary on band, but that can be, uh, uh, it would be better to, to mention a density of current because one number can be high or low. So what is the size of the uh, contact? So the question is uh, what is the size and the answer is I don't know. I just took this picture from chapter 5 in Fox. So if you read this then then you can check that or you can check some of the original articles. So unfortunately, unfortunately I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. So the, the, the size of the device is probably listed in the paper which is cited. Uh, cited by Fox. Uh, this cartoon here on the bottom right shows um, a schematic of what a uh, such an electroluminescence device looks like but first uh, so here this is electroluminescence how can we make this into a laser? and basically what we need to do is we need to take such an electroluminescent medium where we can inject a current and then we need to have two mirrors on both sides a highly reflecting mirror on one side and on the other side we have a an output coupler a mirror which reflects most of the light but a little bit comes through so if we have two mirrors around such a um, device such an electroluminescent material then uh, we can get a, a semiconductor laser if the loss mechanisms are not too large and if we actually can get this material to, uh, uh, to be an efficient emitter. Uh, this is a, a schematic of what such a semiconductor laser might look like. Well first I need to be able to apply a current and for that I need to have metal contacts. So I start with a uh, partially conducting uh, N-type gallium arsenide substrate and I put a metal contact in the back. Uh, usually that would be gold. 
and then I need another metal contact in the front. And now the problem with this device is because I have metal contacts in the back and in the front, this device cannot emit in the vertical direction because uh, I have uh, metal contacts. I have thick gold contacts so the light cannot, be th cannot go through. Therefore, the device can only emit and laze in the in-plane direction. So I take a piece of this device and then I cleave it. I just break it. And these cleavage planes are typically very sharp. So the cleavage plane will act as the mirrors. And then I have an intrinsic layer of uh, gallium arsenide between this aluminum gallium arsenide PN junction. So I have this confined uh, gallium arsenide region between L gas barriers. And by uh, creating, uh, by applying a voltage, I create a current. I create electron hole pairs here in the uh, gallium arsenide region. And if I create enough electron hole pairs, then uh, I'm getting light out uh, through the cleaved edges. Uh, so that would be a conventional type of a semiconductor laser. Nowadays, people are more interested in vertical cavity emitting lasers where the light is coming out uh, the top. And the reason we would like to do that is because such vertical cavity emitting devices can be made much smaller. Here, I need a macroscopic piece, maybe a millimeter in size, because I need these cleaved edges. Uh, but if I have a vertical cavity emitting device, then, then a few micron diameter will be sufficient to, uh, uh, to get good light emission. And then uh, if I could do that, then I can make uh, displays using uh, semiconducting LEDs. So it's 1016, so maybe I can continue for about half an hour. So now we're done with the uh, luminescence, and now we'll move on to uh, chapter six, which is about uh, quantum confinement and quantum structures. So quantum confinement starts with a discussion of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, in quantum mechanics or wave mechanics, an electron is a particle, but at the same time it is also a wave. And if, a, if an electron, a free electron traveling through vacuum, has a very precisely defined energy, then it also has a very precisely defined uh, momentum. And such a particle is a plane wave with one very precise wavelength. Because it is a wave, it has an infinite extent. You know, such a plane wave, it goes to infinity this way, it goes to infinity that way. So an electron with a very precisely defined momentum has no, uh, has no well-defined position. In practice, we'd like to say, well, the electron is approximately here and it has approximately that uh, energy. And therefore, in order to achieve this, we need to form wave packets. And these wave packets are a combination of several frequencies. So I have a Gaussian distribution in uh, frequency space, in energy space. And that gives me a wave packet with a Gaussian uh, distribution of the uh, probability of where the electron is located. So this is the uh, basis for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So delta x times delta p must be greater or equal to h bar over 2. So that means that um, 
I can either determine the position of a particle or the momentum or some combination thereof as long as this product is greater than uh, something on the order of h bar. Um, there is a similar Heisenberg uncertainty principle for energy and time and the product of the energy and time uncertainties uh, must also be greater than h bar. Now, I've said this before, because of this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I can violate energy conservation. I can have an error delta t, I, in, I can violate uh, energy conservation, but I can only violate that for a very short time. The product of the time during which I violate energy conservation, that product must be greater than h bar over 2. Now the same is true for this other Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I said before that crystal momentum must be conserved, but that is only true for an infinite crystal. If the crystal is not infinite, if I have a nanostructure, then, I, then momentum conservation is no longer required. So let's say I have a nanoparticle, some sphere with some radius delta x. Therefore, the momentum of that particle can no longer be zero. The momentum can only be zero in an infinite crystal. In a nanoparticle, the electrons will always have some um, uncertainty in the momentum. And because of the momentum uncertainty, they will have some energy which can be calculated from the kinetic energy using the momentum uncertainty. So in a nanoparticle, I'm getting a confinement energy and the energy of an electron in a nanoparticle is equal to the energy in the bulk crystal plus this confinement energy, which goes like delta P squared over 2m. If I am at very high temperatures, then particles will have thermal energy anyways, and I don't have to worry about that confinement energy. But at very low temperatures, or if the nanoparticle is really very small, then this confinement energy will be larger than kT, and then it can be observable. So if the mass is very small, or if the uh, temperature is very low, or if the nanoparticle is very small, then these quantum confinement effects will be important. There are several types of quantum structures. And uh, let us start first with a bulk crystal and then go to two-dimensional, one-dimensional, and zero-dimensional quantum structures. So in a bulk crystal, uh, several lectures ago, we calculated the uh, density of states for a bulk crystal, and we found that it is proportional to uh, the square root of E minus EG multiplied by some, uh, uh, multiplied by the square root of the effective mass. So if we go from a three-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system, so that would, for example, be a thin layer of gallium arsenide in between aluminum arsenide barriers, then the density of states in a two-dimensional system becomes flat, independent of mass, independent of energy. We'll talk about those steps in a minute. So here, m to the power of one half, m to the power of zero. In a quantum wire, it goes like one over the square root of the mass. So the density of states looks like this. And the way these densities of states are calculated is just like we did before. Uh, just that the, instead of doing the integral over three dimensions, we need to do the integral over fewer dimensions. And finally, the zero-dimensional uh, quantum structure is called a quantum dot, 
And in this case, uh, we just get discrete states that look like a delta function. So now I have several slides about how do we make such quantum structures. And first I will talk about how do we make thin layers. We produce thin layers using epitaxial techniques such as molecular beam epitaxy, chemical vapor deposition, atomic layer deposition, etc. So we start with a substrate and we want to grow a very thin layer of something else on that substrate. As an example here, uh, we start with a clean substrate of indium antimonide and we want to grow a thin layer of tin or a germanium tin alloy on that. Um, as we grow a thin layer on the substrate, we want that layer to take on the same crystal structure as the indium antimonide, as the substrate. If there's any kind of dirt on the substrate, then most of the time the layer that we grow will be highly defective. And therefore, it is really important that we start with a very, very, very clean surface. How do we get a clean surface? For silicon and germanium, we simply heat it to a very high temperature until any remaining dirt that used to stick on the surface has gone away. Uh, the problem with that is that heating the substrate for materials that are uh, compounds like indium arsenide or indium antimonide or gallium arsenide, uh, the heating technique uh, will destroy the surface. For example, for gallium arsenide, the arsenic will simply disappear from the surface if you heat it and you are left with a gallium rich surface. And therefore, uh, there are other techniques how we can clean this. And in this case, for indium antimonide or gallium arsenide, there's a technique uh, that was pioneered by Lauren Pfeiffer at Bell Labs that we expose the substrate to atomic hydrogen. And that is how we can clean the uh, substrate. So first we clean it. And then the second step is that we need to expose the substrate to a flux of materials, to a flux of elements that are responsible for making up this thin layer. So here we have uh, the substrate and then here we have um, effusion cells. So we have one cell with germanium atoms and another cell with uh, tin atoms. And um, we heat the germanium in this crucible to a very high temperature. And the we don't really want the germanium to evaporate, but we bring the, the temperature of the molten germanium very close to the uh, temperature where it would evaporate. So then we have some non-zero vapor pressure of the germanium, so individual germanium atoms will escape this effusion cell and will um, migrate towards the substrate. They will diffuse in all directions, but we're guiding them uh, towards the substrate. In order for this to happen, we need to have a vacuum chamber, and the vacuum is needed for two reasons. One, to allow the uh, germanium atoms to diffuse towards the uh, substrate and the second reason is that uh, of course we need UHV in order to prevent reoxidation of the substrate. So here we have a tin in the second cell and we have shutters that we can open or close and uh, depending on uh, how often we, we open or close these shutters that determines uh, how thick this uh, film will be and what uh, the layer uh, and what the composition of this layer will be. 
Uh, in order to make sure that the substrate is really clean, we have this reed gun. Reed means very high energy electron diffraction. So we shoot very high energy electrons to the substrate and they get diffracted by the substrate. And these are typical reed patterns. A pattern like this uh, will, uh, tells us that we have a clean indium antimonide surface and then as we start growing the film, the reed pattern changes. And from the reed pattern, we can tell uh, the quality of our, uh, the quality of our epitaxial layer. So that's the first uh, technique, uh, molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, the second technique is uh, chemical vapor deposition. And again, we have a growth chamber. And in the growth chamber, there are the substrates. But now, instead of exposing the substrate to these elemental uh, fluxes of the atoms that we want to grow, of the layers that we want to grow, uh, our elements are provided to the substrate in the form of uh, gaseous precursors. So I have an inlet valve which allows various different uh, gases to be plumbed in and then the gas uh, hits the uh, substrate inside the growth chamber. In addition to the precursor gases, we usually have an inert carrier gas, usually hydrogen. And for the precursors, for silicon, we would use silane, for example. For germanium, we can use germane or higher order molecules with silicon and germane. Uh, for um, the group five elements, we can use arsine and phosphine as precursors. And uh, for the group three elements, we use metal organics. For example, trimethyl gallium, that's a gallium atom which is bound to uh, three methyl groups. And because of the use of metal organics, this technique is often also called MOCVD, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, or metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. These are all the same acronyms. Uh, here we don't need UHV because we're pumping in gases. However, these gases are very, very dangerous. With arsine and phosphine, just a little leak in your vacuum chamber, you can easily kill everybody in the building. So these are very, very diff uh, toxic materials. So therefore, uh, the... Um, for, if you want to do MBE, you pay a million dollars for the big vacuum chamber. If you want to do MOCVD, you pay a million dollars for your extensive safety systems. And you need to hire full-time safety specialists. Uh, all gases need to be um, double walled, so, so you need to have uh, double containment. And um, you need to have uh, monitors. Um, Phosphine, you cannot smell phosphine. By the, time you, by the time it reaches a concentration that you could smell, you're already dead. So um, uh, these, these gases are really very toxic. They are also uh, flammable and explosive. Silane is highly explosive. Uh, nevertheless, where do your phones come from? They're all produced using these techniques. So factories all over the world, there's thousands of these reactors which all produce the electronics that we use. So it is possible to do this without any accidents. And um, I worked in a factory. Yes, there were alarms once, once in a while. And usually the alarm means that the, the alarm system failed. It was never anything where there was an actual leak. And then, you know, the entire the entire factory gets, gets evacuated. So it is possible to do this uh, very safely. The other thing that needs to be said is that these gases, you do not simply release them into the atmosphere, uh, but you need to either burn them or do something else with them 
uh, to avoid them from uh, getting, into the, getting into the atmosphere. So none of these materials are really toxic provided they are in the right, uh, provided they're in the right form. So it is so, uh, they need to be um, passivated. Uh, this technique is used in industry because it has much higher throughput because the growth rates are much higher than with uh, molecular beam epitaxy. So how does this uh, MOCVD growth work? And this is indium phosphide as an example. So we already have uh, several layers grown and then here at the surface, these little white spheres, this is hydrogen. So this surface is hydrogen terminated. You cannot have simply a dangling bond. Something would stick to it. So these surfaces are hydrogen terminated. And this is a trimethyl indium molecule, which is coming from the gas phase, and this molecule reaches the surface. This surface is hot and thermal energy is transferred to the molecule. And this is an indium atom with three methyl groups attached to it. So the gray, that's carbon, and the white stuff, that's hydrogen. So this molecule here comes to the surface. The surface is hot. The first thing this molecule will do is it will expel two of its methyl groups the third methyl group remains, and that allows the uh, remaining molecule to stick to the surface. At this point, the molecule is not chemically bonded, but there's some van der Waals interaction between the um, molecule and the surface. This so the first process, the expulsion of the two uh, methyl groups that requires energy and therefore your growth rate will depend on the temperature of the substrate. If the substrate is at room temperature then this molecule will simply bounce off and it will not react with the, with the um, surface at all. The next step after the adsorption will be that this molecule will diffuse along the surface until it finds a step and here at the step, it will get rid of that hydrogen and it will be incorporated into the crystal. It will also get rid of that remaining methyl group and it will bond uh, with, uh, with hydrogen probably. So the surface diffusion is the other limiting factor. So the first limiting factor is the uh, breaking up of this molecule and the second one is the uh, surface diffusion and the, those two processes are controlled by the uh, temperature of the substrate. And then um, in addition to the trimethyl indium we also want phosphine and these, these phosphine atoms also uh, uh, stick to the surface so this is how I can uh, grow uh, thin layers of indium phosphide on a substrate. Um, this process is very difficult to control. I need to have the right concentration of indium to uh, phosphine uh, gases because if the gas ratio is off then I may have a lot of defects. I may have too much or too little of one uh, element uh, compared to the other and um, if the temperature is too low then the layer is highly defective if the temperature is too high then there can be other problems uh, the, uh, if the temperature is too high then the um, growth may be too fast and therefore I will also get a very defective um, growth um, but, you know, this is uh, under control and uh, similar MOCVD processes are producing all of the devices that we have in our phones.
Uh, the third process for thin layer deposition is atomic layer deposition. You see here the growth is controlled by the temperature of the substrate and by the partial pressures of the uh, precursors in the carrier gas. So wouldn't it be nice if I can only grow one layer at a time and how long and how much I expose the surface to my precursor wouldn't matter. And this process is called a comic layer deposition and it's been around since the 1960s or 70s but it really has become popular only for the last 10 or 15 years um, because of the need for um, very thin uh, gate metal, metal oxides in uh, CMOS devices. Atomic layer deposition is typically used for oxides or nitrites such as alumina, zinc oxide or uh, hafnium dioxide which is the gate dielectric for CMOS devices. So here I start with a surface and then I expose my surface to trimethyl alumin to trimethyl aluminum which is a gas and then I'm growing exactly one layer of aluminum so the aluminum will stick to the surface but only one layer and then if I expose it for longer then I will not grow several layers of aluminum but simply if I already have grown one layer then the rest of the trimethyl aluminum precursor molecules will just be pumped out. So I'm, a, I'm growing exactly one layer and then I stop the precursor flow and I pump out the remaining uh, trimethyl aluminum atom, uh, molecules. So the first precursor is trimethyl aluminum and I'm growing one layer of aluminum and now I want to grow one, one layer of oxygen and the easiest precursor to use for oxygen is simply water. So now I'm exposing this surface to a uh, pulse of uh, water vapor and I am growing exactly one layer of oxygen on top of that one layer of aluminum. And then I repeat this process, I'm growing another layer of aluminum, another layer of oxygen and that is how I can grow uh, very thin layers of aluminum oxide. So the process is self-limiting, I only grow one half layer at a time, I'm not growing bulk aluminum, only one layer. There's this sequential exposure to precursors, in this case I have the substrate simultaneously exposed to uh, both precursors. And it's very good for oxide and nitrites. It requires a very low growth temperature. This can be done at room temperature or maybe only at, uh, at 100 or 200 degrees. And sometimes I can use plasma or photoassisted growth which will help me uh, breaking up this, these precursors. There's one slide that I should have added here and that is pulse laser deposition. Uh, but unfortunately I forgot that and uh, perhaps that's not even necessary to talk about pulsed laser deposition because you have people here that know a lot more about that in this building than I do. Uh, and perhaps just briefly that with pulsed laser deposition you have a substrate and you heat that, hit that substrate with a short laser pulse and then uh, some of the uh, you, you hit that target with a short laser pulse and some of the material will be evaporated from the target and gets deposited on the substrate where you want it. You had a question. I'm sorry? So the question is whether this structure will be porous and the answer is no it will not. If you do it right it will not be porous. Uh, so uh, we had a poster at the ellipsometry conference about zinc oxide and um, 
How would you measure if it is porous? You can do atomic force microscopy. If it's very porous, The film will be a, the film will have the same properties as the bulk, the only difference being that it is thinner. But if you continue this for an infinite amount of time, then you can get the same properties as you had in the bulk, almost the same. Yeah, you will still have to deal with things like dislocations, but you can make very, very thin films with this, no pores. You could see the pores, for example, with electron microscopy, with atomic force microscopy. Uh, you could see the uh, pores with, uh, with um, X-ray reflectance because the film would have a lower density than the bulk, but none of this, uh, none of this happens. So it is a quarter till 11 now, so perhaps this would be a good time to stop, and then I will continue uh, in two weeks with more information about the physics on nanostructures, but um, the reason I included these last few slides was that, um, you know, my students are physics students and they know nothing about the real world. And then I show them things like this and then, you know, they're, they really get excited because it means that, you know, you can actually apply the physics to do things. And also, if we study such materials, you know, at least we should make a little bit of an effort to understand where do these things come from. So, uh, that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, any more questions? Yes? You mentioned thermodynamic literature of electron hole pairs. From the most common definition of thermodynamic temperature is just a statistical matrix of the So, uh, to s I, I need to repeat your question for the, for the camera. I think your question is about temperature is a statistical concept, statistical physics, and therefore if you only have one electron, you cannot have a temperature. So how many electrons do you need? And uh, that is a good question, but uh, that cannot really be answered with photoluminescence spectroscopy because with your laser, the lowest, uh, 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter is a low electron density. So you have 10 to the 17 uh, and that is, you know, statistically speaking already a very, very large number and therefore um, you can use statistical techniques for 10 to the 17 electrons. But, you know, how much can you go down? I don't know in order to define a temperature. Other questions? Yes. Isn't uh, ILD very, very slow technology? Yes. So, um, since you grow one half layer at a time, it takes several seconds to grow one half layer. It might take a minute to grow one monolayer of, of material. So this technique is extremely slow. However, the most interesting application at the moment of atomic layer deposition is to grow a 30 to 50 angstrom or maybe even 20 angstrom thick hafnium oxide gate oxide on top of your silicon CMOS channel. So this is the wrong technique uh, to grow thick layers because it is so slow. On the other hand, if you want to grow a continuous non-porous layer of a material like hafnium oxide where you can grow um, very, w which is very conformal, uh, 
With MBE, you're dealing with a problem that it's nice to grow flat films, but if you want to have memory on your phone, then you need these embedded memory structures which are bottle shaped and have like one over a hundred aspect ratios. Uh, with this uh, technique with atomic layer deposition, you can grow very high aspect ratio layers which are very, very thin. And they're only, because they are so thin, the, the time required is not really an issue. Yes. So the question is about the position of this photoluminescence peak relative to the slope of this absorption peak. And the position of this photoluminescence peak is where the second derivative of the absorption is zero. Yes? And I would say that uh, that will depend on the material that you study, that will depend on the defects, that will depend on the strength of, of excitonic effects. Um, and there is no simple answer to this. It depends on, on the particular sample. It depends on the defect density that you have. So there's no general answer. That's why this shift will usually depend on what type of material you have. Other questions? If not, then thank you very much. And uh, please enjoy the nice weather over this weekend. I almost feel at home. Uh, it's a little bit colder here in Prague than in Las Cruces, but I've definitely enjoyed the nice weather here uh, over the last few weeks. So thank you very much. See you in two weeks.